Hey everyone, on this week's Trade to Black podcast, we bring in the Wolf of Weed Street, Jason Spatafor, who touches on the frustration that mounted this week on Twitter amongst cannabis investors and how it reached a tipping point. He outlines on what needs to change and why. Also, he breaks down on how the market could see another leg down, and if so, when's the right time to buy and sell? All this and more in our latest Trade to Black podcast. Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Trade to Black podcast. I'm your host, Shad Dales, and as usual, before we get into the podcast, all views on the Trade to Black podcast and the guests on this podcast are purely opinion. You should not treat any opinions expressed by us or our guests as investment advice. The views on this podcast are solely intended to be informational and are not investment advice. All right, let's get to it. Let's welcome in our first guest of the week, the Wolf of Weed Street and partner of True Trading Group, uh, Group. Jason Spatafora, who joins us again. Good to see you back, brother. How are things? Things are good. How are you guys? Good. Stirring up a storm on Twitter, aren't we? <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get into that in just a minute. I uh, also want to bring in, obviously, lead financial writer Benjamin A. Smith. Great to see you, brother. How was the week? Week was great. Uh, we got some green this week. It was good to see. Biotech stocks, even. Uh, best week uh, so far in 2022. So, life's good. Yeah, well, let's begin with that and in kind of coinciding with the cannabis industry. Uh, it appears that frustration among investors reached a tipping point, to say the least, this week. Uh, when I look at the overall market, it took a turn for the better, uh, somewhat of a bear market rally as we inch towards the end of the quarter, yet nothing moved in cannabis. So if the overall market takes the next leg down, Jason, uh, what does that mean, do you think, for the cannabis market? Like, where are we? Um, look, I, I, you know, as I've been saying for a while, like we're going to go lower, right? Yeah. We, we just lack, we lack the liquidity and we're, you know, we're coming to this point where, um, people have to make a decision, you know, do they buy cannabis stocks that are going to remain a liquid that still don't have the things that they need to really take off or, you know, if a market bottoms, are they going to invest in growth where everybody is going to pile into? Um, and, you know, that gives you a much better return in the short yeah. term. Yeah. How much lower? If you say we're going to go lower, how much lower do you think we go? I mean, uh, you know, in terms of the spy, I think that at a minimum, we hit 345, which is wow. like the 200 week uh, you know, average, um, for cannabis, I, I don't know, you know, like we, we just broke 11. Okay. Yeah. So we, you know, we had a month where we did all of this work in the thirteens and it felt like, Hey, you know, it, there was, uh, like a stop gap there and then CPI numbers hit and, you know, then we, we, we dropped 20%. Mm -hmm. Um, so if people start trying, you know, start selling their pot stocks to realize that loss, um, and use that capital to, to get back into growth, it could be, you know, really slippery. Like, I don't think that the valuations on like the tier one, um, companies make any sense, Yeah. but that, you know, as high as they went, to, to valuations that were probably a little bit stretched, we could go the other way just as easily. So I, I think that you have to really use like COVID lows as, uh, as, as your level. Really? Wow. These companies are trading below cash as well, which blows my mind away. But clearly this is a retail environment as we've discussed. Ben, do you agree with a lot what Jason just outlined? Yeah, I do. I, I, I do agree with a lot. Uh, you know, that last point about it, it did look for a while that pot stocks were actually uh, trying to form a bottom because uh, the market was was cratering there for a while and it was holding up around the, you know, the 13 level, you know, between 12 and a half to 14 or 13 to 14 and a half, somewhere around there. And it looked like there was some resilience there in the face of some very, you know, big declines on the broad market. But it, it gave way. It gave way, uh, you know, with the CPI number, number came out and it became clear that, you know, consumer spending could be pinched a little bit. And obviously that's not really great for retail stocks. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I do think it's a tricky market insofar that if you 
think the broad market has more to go down, and this is just a bear market rally, which I tend to think right now because I don't think valuations overall with the broad market have come into a place where people think this is really cheap. Then it's going to be hard for you know cannabis stocks to sort of fight that trend if you know the ultimate destination is S and P thirty two hundred or three thousand or thirty four hundred or whatever. Right now we're still you know only at about what thirty nine hundred, close to that level, and you know. That's only 700 points off the high or whatever. And we're going into, you know, quantitative tightening. We're going into, you know, a, a, a big rate hike cycle that's still uh, rate hike cycle that still has a ways to go. So, yeah, it's going to be hard to fight that trend. But yeah. there are reasons to be positive. I'm sure we'll get into that uh, in, a, in a minute. Well, the only thing you have is volume. And as I said before, we're not really backed by institutions right now. This is a frustrated retail audience that's obviously involved in this industry. And well, as mentioned earlier, when I said frustration, it reached a tipping point online this week. Randall Holdings held a conform filing of Q1 2022 financials. And Todd Harrison conducted a Twitter Spaces, which I believe was co-hosted by company management and pretty much ignited a firestorm online. So, Jason... Uh, you have one of the strongest voices in the Twitter space, and you were, I guess, venting your frustration based off of that. So why were you frustrated? What what went down that, you know, just reached a tipping point for you this week? Um, look, I, it's tricky, right? Because I think that my frustration came down to the fact that, look, you can be bullish cannabis right okay. and yep. i think if you're looking at it purely from a business and and growth standpoint there's a lot to be bullish about mm -hmm. um, but the growth in the last decade has been amazing but we have to be honest with um, not only ourselves but the people that listen to us um and you don't you think know, that's people, happening no, I, I don't. And I don't think it's, it's happened. It's been happening for a while. It's like everything is good news. Everything is hurry up and wait. And then the whole market gets, you know, all jazzed up thinking this is it. This is it. And then, you know, we take an, another leg down when those things that were supposed to happen just don't materialize. And one of the things that I've been saying for a lot since really the all time highs in February, you know, things like safe banking 280E, you know, are a bonus. You cannot base your investment off of something that has not happened, mm -hmm. right? And if it does yeah. happen, then you can, you can scale up, scale in, um, or, you know, like just be happy with what you have where everybody has been trying to catch this before it's happened, you know, without really understanding basic civics and all the things that happen in Washington. Right. So like, you know, uh, Schumer wants to come to some kind of arrangement. Well, you know, now Roe v. Wade is, uh, you know, that's going to suck up all of the oxygen in D.C. for however long. And yeah. that's after gun control, which, yeah. you know, after Uvalde um, became a big talking point. And then it's like, well, what's next? And it's like for an economy that is going through inflation and they're basically banging these cannabis companies at like 70 to 80 percent tax rates. Why would they just stop taking that free money right now? Why would they, why would they mm -hmm. be in any kind of rush to fix those problems? You know? So, you know, my frustration is like, it's okay <clears throat> to be bullish, right? But also you, you have to give the other perspective. I don't think that there's any more person more bullish on cannabis than me, right? I've been, you know, doing this for a while, but I've also understood that we have these massive downturns in this sector since yeah. the very, very beginning. Okay. So going back to my first investment in 2013, we have never had a time period from March into the summer where we haven't dropped at a minimum of 35%. Yeah. And sometimes it's yeah. more, sometimes yeah. it's less. Yeah. 2016 to 2017, it was 70%. 2018, 
2017 to the summer of 2018, it was 50%. And we always get these big moves up. And the, the reason we had the big we had these big moves up is because we haven't had a custody issue. Mm -hmm. And until the custody issue is solved, everybody is essentially just pissing in the wind. Um, and, you know, and trying yeah. to spread this like hopium fairy dust over everybody. Yes, we know that the valuations don't make sense. We know that the biggest companies are, you know, doing a billion a year in revenue, but the market isn't valuing them based off of that yeah. because the market is made up of retail investors. It's 95% yeah. retail. And yeah. in cannabis, you cannot have the rating or, you know, or like the, the, the sector um, prices made by retail investors because yeah. retail investors for the most part don't know what they're doing <laughs> right and you know what jason let me let me let me stop you right there too because i think what you said is absolutely true and 100 like right on the mark but this extends beyond more just whatever twitter influencers and it, it's definitely uh, a grab bag of of several it, it extends to the analysts as well because when you read the analyst research you don't see a lot of things like custody issues. They, 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 they don't really tell you about that sort of thing, right? So even the analyst research all the way up to the investment banks is very obviously jaded or, or skewed towards the bullish narrative as it always is. Oh, okay. so, well, I, I, uh, you know, from the very beginning, you know, retail investors have been in the lurch because there's been, of all the sectors I follow, there's been no investment bank coverage has been more wrong than the cannabis sector going back to the you know the canadian cannabis days all the bullish price stuff even went back to uh when when canada was first opening up and uh gmp securities thought that canopy growth would own 65 percent of the market and that you know canada would do like three billion in sales i think it was in, the, in year one it was completely off the mark canopy you know tanked it, it was just a disaster. The research in this industry is a disaster. And I think it extends well beyond just Twitter guys or whoever. It, it extends all the way up to the, the banks covering. Jason, stuff. what do you okay. think of that? Yeah, my rebuttal is going to be perfect. Um, I 100% <laughs> agree with you. Okay. But here's the thing. Um, and yeah, they've been wildly wrong. They've always been wildly wrong. Wild. I've never taken um, cues from an analyst in this sector, whether it was, um, you know, somebody from Cantor or Jeffries or wherever. Okay. Because they've, they've just been wrong. Right. And they give these, these 12 month price targets. I mean, let's, if we go back <clears throat> and look at like the 12 month price targets from a year ago, these some of these companies would have to go up a thousand percent from here, yeah, just to, to meet the target that is supposed we're supposed to be at now, like yeah. today, okay. So, yeah, they've been wildly wrong, yet you, you see, like, oh, look at this post from, from this guy, look at what he's saying, oh, he's optimistic, and they're using. You know, it's like you can't have it both ways. You can't be like this analyst is dead wrong, has been dead wrong when they say something bad. And then all of a sudden they say something good and they're like, oh, let, let me let me just get it out there. Let me let me just post this. Um, it, it's like it, it's like taking Jim Cramer's tweets as like gospel. There's no contrarian indicator like. Um, some of these analysts, right? So and, why why you know, do these, yeah. why do these analysts continue to wildly get things wrong? Everybody has their own opinion, but what's your thoughts and why they continue to get this wrong? Yeah, well, my my thoughts are that they they don't factor in the most important thing, which is volume, 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 volume. Volume is everything. It has always been everything in cannabis. And when volume drops off a cliff and dries up, which it usually does from March to, you know, uh, the middle of the summer, you know, hence my yearly Ides of March post, um, you know, everybody thinks, hey, no, this year it's going to be different. It, it, it's never been different. Mm -hmm. It's always been um, either par for the course pullback or 
worst parts of the Bible pull back, right? And if people, if, if we as cannabis influencers just keep saying things are great, things are great, you know, value, you know, like these valuations don't make sense. Like you could only do that so long, mm -hmm. right? Like even I'm guilty of it, right? Because I'm going off of a different model. So let me, is... let me ask you this then. Um, Todd's like in all fairness, this industry needs Todd Harrison, people like Todd Harrison. He's a bit, a big supporter of the industry since day one, educated a lot of people. Um, have you had any conversations recently directly with him? If so, like, you know, what are some of the things that you guys discuss? Like, what are, what are some of the things that maybe you'd like to see? And I know you kind of outlined it before, but, uh, what would you like to see change? And most importantly, like, have you had conversations with him? No, look, I love Todd, you know, in, um, I think it was April of 2020, you know, him and I did a thing together on YouTube that kind of outlined, you know, what cannabis could do that, you know, the U.S. market was ready. Now, I hadn't been back in, you know, I exited cannabis, as you know, Ben will tell you, in March of 2019, I got out of the, you know, the rest of my positions, but I sold 80% going into Canada going legal, right? right? Because the dynamic completely changed. Smart move. Some of those people still remain bullish. I, I waited, you know, I didn't get back in at the COVID lows. Um, I came back in July of 20 and things started to materialize, but, you know, always keeping in mind that you've got to manage your positions. Um, you've got to take risk off um, at, at specific times. Now, you can be bullish, but at some point, you know, you also want retail investors to be as protected and insulated as possible. Mm -hmm. And if you're if you're going to be that person, you cannot just be. Everything's going to go to the moon. Yeah. Now, I'll, I'll put a caveat in that. Right. Everybody will be right again. OK, but the time horizon has is now a lot different. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can, you can still remain bullish, right? Like I'm still invested in pot stocks. I'm not as invested as I was in February, 2021, um, or in September of 2021. Okay. But I can stay in because I've, I've, I, while we were going up, I took that risk off Yeah. that principle plus profit off. Okay. Have I added and watch those positions just basically blow up? Yeah. But I'm, you know, like I'm, I'm adding profit. It doesn't make me feel any better that, you know, I sold some cure leaf at let's say 18 and then I bought it at, at 12 or 13 thinking, Hey, this is great, but I do have some protection, you know? So I, like <clears throat> I haven't talked to Todd in a while. I think he's a great guy as far as, um, you know, information, but I also know, look, a lot of people follow him and they take every word said as gospel, mm -hmm. right? These aren't people that are really participating outside of cannabis. Some people in this space, that's all they invest in. They've got mm -hmm. 80 to a hundred percent of their portfolios in cannabis, mm -hmm. which is crazy. Mm -hmm. it's crazy to be polarizing to be industry. That one, yeah. To be yeah. that one sided. Look, you know. it, it's a, it's going to be a monster industry, but right now it is just sucking your capital from you. And, you know, look, if you were just invested in cannabis in 2021, you missed the best year in equities. Yeah. Like the best year in yeah. such a long time. Yeah. You know, the, the, the spy going from basically 330 to 480 or whatever yeah. it was, 460. Yeah. yeah. You know, you, yeah. you, you missed that. It's out. been a double cost in a lot of ways. Right. It's been a double cost in a lot of ways because you missed a historic bull market. And then if you're invested or outsized investment in pot stocks, obviously you lost capital. And when you could have been making in basically any other sector. Yeah, ben, and, and which, all the while, 
I was going to say, and Ben, what's your take people. on a lot of the stuff that Jason had said? Like, y- you have a big voice and a big profile through the industry as well, but <clears throat> what what's the message that you would like to get through to investors right now? Is you, like, you know, again, um, great information. I, I appreciate, obviously, the feedback as to what you're explaining here, Jason. Um, do you agree a lot of the stuff that he's outlining as well? And if so, like, what, what's some of the messaging that you try to get through to people that are following the space? Yeah, I, I 100% agree with what Jason's saying. I think it's uh, on point. Um, you know, I'll caveat by saying as well that you know not all the top influencers, such as Todd, such as other people, are are, are always like they. I do see bullet like bearish notes put out or notes that doubt that safe banking, for example, will pass. So it's not. I don't see you know 100% rah rah all the time. So you know to be fair. But yeah, you know, other than that, I, I do agree with a lot w- of what Jason is saying. And also, too, I would add that I, I find it kind of sad because this whole environment on Twitter and, and maybe the over bullishness and about touting every single possible catalyst out there. I find it sad that it's created an environment of sort of like the, the boy who cried wolf environment where safe banking gets shut down six times over the last four years. Right. And all these things that could happen now, the latest one with uh uh, with the the climax, with possibly the uplisting of of U.S. equities, right? No, people are jumping on that, and it's receiving a lot of likes and, and retweets. But it's it's creating an environment where now, if you've been invested for a long time, you just yeah. don't believe any yeah. of this is going to happen. Right? There's been so <clears throat> many a... things that hurt, like so many de- dejections, right? So many things not coming through that now a lot of the sell, a lot of the people have been there since the beginning. Now I think a lot of people are just going to get out. If the market rallies a little bit, maybe it goes to 15 or 16 or 20 on MSOs or whatever. They're looking to cut their losses, right? So they've you know, they've hung in all this time, and you're going to see a large portion of people just cut their losses because they want to get their capital back and not stay invested. And at some point, the market's just going to absolutely rip. It's going to absolutely rip, and it, 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 a lot of people are not going to take the gains that they probably deserve just because of all the false promises of, of the past. And that's what I find sad. So if there's anything that I would say to investors is if you, your original thesis was to stay in for the long term, if you had that five or 10 year plan, don't, you know, probably maybe you want to think about sticking with that because it would be a shame if you're starting cutting your losses and taking a 20% loss after being in three years. And then the thing yeah. absolutely rips because something does yeah. shake loose. On yeah. That I, look, I, I agree. Right. Uh, but, but again, that's, that goes back to what I was saying, right? If you, if you don't take your gains while they're there, while the market's moving up um, and, you know, protect yourself. Yeah. You you can't make that determination of staying in. Like I can stay in, and when there's strength, I can reallocate capital. I don't care if I have to chase it because on that strength, I understand what it'll do, right? So, you know, like the things that I'm thinking of now, and part of the reason that I haven't blown out of every position is because I'm I'm more interested in the time value that I have on something, you know? So if like I'm buying, um, like, uh, let's say uh, green thumb at like yep. nine bucks. Yeah. Okay. Like uh, if it goes to seven, I'm not going to sell it. Right. Um, I could, but if it takes like five months for it to go to seven, and then it goes to seven and then I, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I panic and then I sell. It'll, And then it rips, right? You know, eight months later, which if I had just held, I would have had long-term capital gains. So I'm basically costing myself 20%. So my threshold right now on anything I buy is like, okay, understand like whatever I buy now, I have to hold for a year. Yeah. You know, yeah. that is 100%. going to be for, you know, uh, like it's an added 20%. Um, so I've got protection down 20%, whatever. And I I think that it makes sense to do it. Now, I'm not saying you can't buy pot stocks right now, but you have to. So like one of the things that like, I still buy some, but I'm not buying with my money because I trade a lot. I'll take gains from like options trades and I'll, I'll spread it around. I'll, you know, like I bought some Terra Sen last week. 
some green thumb, some Cresco, um, some things like that. But I'm not buying like massive positions. I'm not buying like 10,000 share clips, right? Um, you can do that. And look, I think if you're looking at this as should I get in? Yeah, look, if you've never been in cannabis, you look like a genius buying now, but you have to understand that they can go lower, right? And, you know, my take has been just sell. It, you know, like I've been saying that since MSOS was like 25 bucks since um, Bullard said yeah. 50 basis points, which was in February. That was it. Like I was like, OK, anything that I bought, I'm selling. So, I sold a ton of my my call options and I, you know, but I've, I've also bought puts. So I've protected myself there. Yeah. I've been short the market, the overall market since april um so ben brings up the boy cry wolf uh who cries wolf um i think the question is right now how realistic is chuck schumer getting the memo before midterms like that that's the thesis right now but how realistic you're saying there's going to be a lot of stuff in washington that's going to consume a lot of the time and this gets pushed on the back burner as well so are we really realistically looking at any kind of movement um uh, of like, CAOA obviously has no chance. Dems are trying to strike a deal before they lose the Senate majority. But um, is that just wishful thinking? Yeah. Yeah. It's wishful thinking. Yeah. You, you know, you, 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 not, you don't listen to what they see. They say, listen to what they do. Mm -hmm. And Schumer spiked safe banking. We could have safe banking right now. Mm hmm you know, which would create a completely different environment, you know, um, because instead of a 14 month downturn, you know, now I don't even know what month we're in, you know, but since 2021. Six quarters in. Yeah, it's nuts. Six quarters. All right. And if you, you know, like, look, you wait to buy on strength. Mm -hmm. That's that has to be what at like. Because look, some people need this money, right? You can't just throw money at this sector right now. If you're gonna throw money at stuff right now, you shouldn't be throwing it at pot stocks. Mm -hmm. You should be throwing it at some growth, some um, some transportation, you know, throw it at things that have already been hammered before we've made this leg down in the market. Those low beta stocks probably will give you the best return in the next 12 months, you know, um, growth is, you know, when, when the market bottoms, that's when you buy growth because everybody will pile into it. Use that, that move, those profits to start adding to your pot stocks. Yeah. I mean, that, that's what I did in during COVID. And I'm going to do that now because you also have to think, you know, look, as an investor, your, your whole thing is I want to build long-term Gener generational wealth, which, you know, we always hear in pot stocks, right? Downturns like this in the market are what makes generational wealth. Yeah. That's a hundred percent what happens. Okay. Pot stocks, you're look it in a legal U S like where, you know, everything's good. These stocks aren't going to, you're going to remember a couple of names everything is going to change mm -hmm. right and yeah. if you're focusing on like oh i'm just gonna buy this because it's cheap or or whatever like you're, you're gonna get killed yeah you know they're they're really good companies. hey jason let me yeah. let me let me ask you this just to backtrack uh before we go too far in into something else um if if there, if because of the the things that are happening, because of the uh, Uvalde and uh, Roe Ro versus Wade, things that you mentioned, and and you see a possibility that uh, that get that cannabis gets overshadowed in the in the near term, leading up to the midterms, and and you you don't think that the odds of safe banking plus or whatever they're trying to do right now will pass. Are you should 
cannabis investors be concerned if Republicans gain both the House and the Senate in the midterms, which is looking very, very possible? And what happens in the two years with Mitch McConnell uh, running the agenda as a Senate majority leader? Uh, what happens then? Uh, I, I'm actually not worried because the best bull markets, ironically, have been during um, when when the Republicans have held the Senate. You know, I mean, think about it. 2016 was a giant move. Everybody, oh, Jeff Sessions, Jeff Sessions. You know, they got spooked from 2016 to to uh, 2018 yeah. was like the golden age of pot stocks, right? Um, and even when Trump was in office, right? So when we had COVID, and you know, we and right up to basically when he left, that's when we had. Our, you know, like, um, but in fairness, was that a, was that not more of a Canadian play when a lot of that stuff was going on? Like, how much did Jeff Sessions, you know, really have to do with the cannabis industry when everything was blowing up? Obviously, north of the border. Well, you know, like uh, Truly made massive moves. Curaleaf made big moves. Some of the other ones made big moves. I mean, obviously, they came down, but they did participate, mm -hmm. and. You know, I, I think it's one of those things where the bankers and the, the, the custodians of the stock know when the Republicans are in office, they're basically getting a pass to do whatever. They don't worry about compliance. They don't uh -huh. worry about, uh -huh. like, FinCEN coming in. <clears throat> they worry about the Democrats. Yeah. They worry about the Democrats going after antitrust. I mean, look at the, you know, like, the, the left has been so bad for cannabis right? This, there's, there's so far left, like the whole social equity thing. Like, look, I, I don't think people should be in jail. It's been an eye opener for, for sure. It's been a huge eye opener. But, but they say like, oh, we don't want to create these monopolies when in fact, what they're doing is making the tier one companies into monopolies, mm -hmm. into or oligopolies, yep. right? Because the smaller operators are all going to die. Mm -hmm. You know, and we're already seeing that. We're already seeing stuff in Michigan, you know, companies going out of business. All these small businesses are are going under. All these social equity things, these, you know, the mandates that are basically coming from the states anyway, are they don't have access to capital. Um, they're they're just dying. Yeah. And the bigger companies that have already established themselves and planted flags all over the United States, some in other countries are going to eat everybody's lunch. This, so it becomes a, it becomes everything, you know, it's it's self-fulfilling for some of the things for the Democrats. It's kind of sobering when you see, you, you knew this. Yeah. And social equity yeah. is bad. Yeah. It's oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. Social equity is actually bad for, you know, the the tier one cannabis and two tier two companies, right? Generally speaking. And uh, it, it it's sort of propping up something that, probably should be left to the free market. So I don't know if that's even a good thing for the industry as they want to do, you know, in some of these states like New York and stuff like that. That remains to be seen. But if you look at the COA, for example, there's a huge tax burden uh, in COA. If it eventually passed after five years, it'd be taxing these companies like, like a 25% clip right off the top for the, for the products, right? So, yeah, and you know, I don't know. Some of it probably yeah, should be left and, to the free market. And cannabis like getting into the cannabis industry is capital intensive and it's still very, very hard. Yeah. Like people say, you know, back in the day, people would be like, Hey, I want to open a dispensary. You know, do you, do you know anybody that's on that? How much money you got? Yeah. And they'd be like, I got like 2 million bucks. <clears throat> and I'm like, okay, when, when you get another 20 million and um, you're looking to not make any money for a couple of years, then talk to mm -hmm. me. And they're like, what? Yeah. But everybody just buys weed. It's, it's so much harder. So it's like, how much money are these small operators, okay, going to get to make this business happen? They're like, oh, we'll, we'll set up a fund. It will never be enough money. We see what's going to happen. They're going to have to access the, the capital markets. That's the only yeah. way to, to, to do it. It's, it's complete cart before the horse, yeah. right? You want them to be able to bank. Yet you don't have a bank available for them. It's kind of like what the Russians did when they were establishing their um, stock market. Yeah. You know, they went from communist where people got shares of the company based off of how long they worked there. 
And then they didn't have a market. And then all of a sudden there was bread lines and people were selling their shares for Walkmans, Jordache jeans and bottles of vodka to the people that would like that became the, the oligarchs. Right. You know, we're basically doing the same thing. Fair points, to say the least. Here, here's a great idea. Why don't we stop talking about cannabis for five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> sure. You know, we look at the overall markets, saw a little bit of a uh, bear market rally towards the end of last week. Uh, inflation continues to be at, what, 40, 50-year highs. However, funds are going to need to rebalance and buy stocks and get exposure once again. So um, could we see a little bit of a rebound um, heading into uh, a brand new quarter? Uh, or is that wishful thinking right now? Yeah, I'm. you know, like... If- um, if you go to my Twitter, I talked about this yesterday and I talked about it the last quarter. We always see some window dressing going into the end of the quarter, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so when funds are rebalancing, they're buying stuff, they're just getting exposure. You know, maybe some of these funds were um, heavy in energy, so they sold their energy. We've seen the pullback in commodities and now they're just, you know, rotating to something else. So maybe you see, you know, transportation, consumer discretionary and um, high growth tech uh, make that move, which pulls the overall market, which changes sentiment. And then just like uh, last quarter, uh, we saw this, you know, nasty pullback. So to put it in perspective um, from the FOMC in March, uh, we went from 415 on the SPY. And then we had FOMC, uh, and then we went to 460 mm-hmm. on the spot. Okay. And the, the very next day, uh, we were at 451 on the spot. And then, you know, if you fast forward a month, um, we were back down to 412. Um, and, you know, everybody was like bearish again. Yeah. You know, look, bear market rallies, uh, we've had uh, four of them so far. Uh, we, you know, and they've averaged like 7%. Um, look, the market was pretty oversold. And uh, yeah, I, I think that we we push into the end of the quarter. Yeah. Um, but then we're going into FOMC in the middle of July, then we get CPI data, but also we're going to have earnings from uh, the, the big companies. Mm-hmm. So that I think is going to be the trigger for the overall market to decline because yeah, you know, and I think the CPI number in August um, will be better, right? If commodities continue to, you know, uh, pull back, right? Because remember the CPI data is that we're going to, that we're going to get in July are going to be for June. Why are commodities being pulled um, back? I mean, look, they, they, they made a, a massive run. Right. They've made a massive run. I mean, you know, the metals like gold and silver have not been doing what they should be doing in a high inflationary environment. Mm -hmm. It's been weird. Um, We all know, like silver is one of the most manipulated things out there, you know, and and I would say gold. But look, oil has essentially doubled in the last year. Um, You know, it's in this market. You've, you've got to be nimble. And when things start ripping, you've got to take your profit yeah. and then, you know, reallocate to another sector, which is what we're seeing. I mean, look, the institutions know what they're doing. Yeah. But if you go out and you start looking at, you know, August puts, um, you know, and where they're at, uh, you know, open interest wise, like everybody's below 360, 350, 330. Um, like it, it's really bull- bearish. Um, and the premium on puts versus calls is significant, you know? I got to ask you, So you're based in Florida. Is this real estate market? Because there's been talks about how Florida is the hottest real estate market in North America for the past, you know, since COVID has really hit. You still seeing that trend down there? A lot of people moving down there? Uh, yeah, I am. I know because it's uh, it's just kind of been crazy. My my neighbor uh, across the street just sold her house um, for a lot. Um, yeah, look, people, you know, you, you see uh, a bunch of fund. I forget who's fun. I think I don't know if it was Ray Dalio's fund has he moved his operation yeah. to Miami. Yeah. You know, people just want to be in, um, 
you know, uh, a place where <clears throat> the taxes aren't high and the weather's good. He was based so out of uh, like tech- Chicago, right? I don't know where he was yeah, based out of, but if he was in Chicago, <laughs> then he was getting banged on taxes. 100. If he was in New York, he was getting crushed or California, yeah. you know? Ben, you're in Toronto. So, yeah, like, yeah, Air Wellness moved down there as well. New Air York. Wellness moved, I believe, from what New York or Massachusetts, something like that. Oh down yeah, to, the the CEO yeah, bought a house so. in um, uh, Biscayne for like twenty million bucks. I think it was north of thirty, if I'm correct. Yeah, but yeah. a lot of people Jonathan. moving, that's for sure. But um, this has been very helpful. Yeah, and look, I, I think I, I think that. That's all. Look, there's a there's a lot of in the overall market. There's a lot of shoes that can drop. It's like pick one. You know, credit card debt is at an all time high. Um, <clears throat> savings is very very low. Yeah. Okay. It's had a major drop. Mortgage rates have gone up higher than they've ever gone up in a short uh, you know time yep. frame. Um, then you have like auto debt. We haven't even seen data with small businesses going bankrupt. Um, we still have high inflation. Um, energy is still going to be an issue. Um, we're going into, you know, we, the Fed can't create oil, mm-hmm. right? And, you know, doing 75 bips next month um, into uh high inflation and and gdp numbers that are also going to come out is going to be a disaster Mm -hmm. right so and like ben was saying we're you know we're going to have a tightening right now our you know the qt the quantity the 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 re um the balance sheet runoff we we have a balance sheet of like 9.6 trillion dollars i think and they're trying to do 47 and a half billion a month and they only started July 5th, uh, June 15th um, because they needed some notes to mature. They were supposed to start the first, so they're already running a deficit. And then in September, we go from $47.5 billion to $95 billion. We, we, we haven't even seen what that's going to do to liquidity, but I can tell you from other years when we've um, had a tightening over a one-year span, okay, one, inflation wasn't this high. Yeah. Okay? That's, yeah. that's first. The balance sheet was definitely not that high. Um, but during those time periods, the S&P 500, you know, traded between a range of like 8 and 13% for a yeah, year. Yeah, it's a big thing. You know, and it really made them. Yeah, and it's not cheap right now either, right? And and that's the problem I have fundamentally with equities as well, uh, just on a macro basis. <clears throat> and probably the reason why Goldman and Merrill Lynch's uh, top economists are, are calling for around 3,000 to 300 for a bottom of around 3,000 to 3,200 S&P is because if you look at the price to earnings ratios of these companies of the S&P 500, it's still around yeah. 17 and a half, 18%. It topped out at around 21 and a half, 22. It's still up that level. And that was the level of the, basically the 2000 tech crash, the S&P 500, what uh, topped out at around 18 or whatever we're, we're just pulling back to that area right now so equities are right. not cheap right now there's not a deal yeah, they're, for they're... the s&p 500 stocks right now right and you're going into a tightening all the things that you talked about so i you know you got to be cautious here i tend to think this is more of a, a bear market rally and it, it could it could go for another few weeks uh you know these yeah, but... rallies can be vicious so a question but, to both but the equity you... question to both you then oh, go ahead I... So, you know, to, to what he was saying about uh, the P.E. ratios on, on something like the SPY. So um, during COVID, we dropped down to 13. OK, that was the multiple. Right. Um, in 2018, when um, Powell first came in and said, oh, you know, we're thinking about raising interest rates, 13 and a half. That puts the SPY right in those target areas of like, you know, between 300 and like 330 okay yeah it's it's crazy yeah stocks are cheap um and you can't look at stocks like well you know roku was 450 now it's you know uh, uh 99 right roku never should have been up there in the first place arc arc etf should have never been up there in the first place this was all a byproduct of yep. 
QE, massive QE, the Federal Reserve buying $2.3 trillion in junk mm -hmm. bonds, which that spiked the market. That's when we just went mm -hmm. straight up. Um, and now, you, you know, you had the, the Fed basically putting on the biggest trade ever, and now they're going to have a problem unwinding it, you know? So it, it's like, and, and again, what's what you were saying with PE, it's trailing PE that you're, they're using, right? So what happens when the earnings, which are, everything's forward looking, Impressed. Start. We start getting downgrades from analysts, and even have the companies saying guiding. So then, lower. what does happen in that situation? You know? so, chaos. Yeah. Chaos. That's what happens in that situation. That's when. That's that's when the market really starts yeah. to mm -hmm. shit themselves, right? Do you think we're? And that's also multiples compress and as jason said it you can't be looking at things like a roku or whatever stock take your stock and say it's down 60 percent when earnings compress because it goes into a recessionary cycle and earnings come down even from you know positive to negative or even very you know low positive i mean the the moves on there can can compress 90 percent, 85 percent. so don't look at things on an aggregate basis saying oh it's down 50 percent. i'm getting a deal if we go into that tightening cycle, recessionary cycle, if, hey. if the Fed tightens too much and stuff, shit starts going the other way uh, and it becomes very deflationary and these earnings get hit, things can go down. As we saw in, in the tech bubble, uh, Amazon can go down 95 percent. Apple can exactly go down 95 percent. So, you know, and this is why pot stock people get killed because they're like, well, you know, uh, true leave was at 50. Now it's at 30. You know, I'm going to. I'm going to load the boat. It's not going down. And then all of a sudden it's at 20. They're like, yep. okay, this is the bottom. And then, you know, things can just keep slipping, right? There's going to be slippage. As yes. high as, as much as valuations go get out of control, they can get out of control the other way. It can't just be one side. So do you sit, so what do you do right now? Do you sit in cash or you, are you looking at certain things? I, look, I've been short. Right. So I, you know, yeah. like going into, um, 2022, right. So in true trading group, um, we were very clear, like myself, um, Michael Edward, uh, one of the other head traders, we were, uh, selling our tech, our high growth, um, or scaling down, you know, stuff, anything that we owned during COVID besides energy and banks, we were selling. Right. So like I was selling mm -hmm. my Facebook in the 300s, <clears throat> my, my the rest of my NVIDIA, a bunch of stuff because Roku, all of that high growth in, you know, when QE stops and then QT begins, which we knew was going to happen, is going to get slammed. Right. So that's what you do. So mm -hmm. if you did that, then you're in a good position. You don't have to wait for a bottom. You know, from where I sold Facebook mm -hmm. to where it is now, I could basically buy it back just with the spread, you know? So what I've been doing is I have been adding to, you know, that those low beta things, my transportation. So I've been yep. buying airlines. Yep. Um, I just bought Boeing under, you know, 120. Um, you know, I got Palantir in the sixes and, and stuff like that. You know, all this, this stuff that's not sexy, and on top of that, I've been short um, the overall market and, you know, via puts, but I haven't been short with like one week out. I've been short like three months out, four months out. I'm short now, you know, um, and my, mm -hmm. you know, like my puts now are for August. And on top of that, you know, when we, we hit that low, that 363 low, then I start buying leaps in low beta. You know, so I bought leaps and carnival and silver, um, in, uh, some other stuff and be expecting the rally. And then I take, and that's, you know, how I hedge against my shorts, but it's been yeah. like 2022 has been great for people that understand like these market cycles and haven't been too bullish. And honestly, like being short the spy since essentially 460 um, makes me not really care about, you know, some of those, uh, pot stock positions that are just getting crushed, but I've also been short 
MSOS yeah. since 25. And I've said this yeah. on Spaces and, well, and, you know, I've said, and, you know, Noah from uh, Advisor Shares, you know, he's been okay with it, right? So I'm just protecting myself. Yeah. The, the, yeah. the MSOS yeah. put yeah. has made more money for me in 2022 than MSOs did for me in 2021, which is nuts. Yeah. Well, I think if anything, what the cannabis industry exposed to a lot of retail investors is that I don't think enough people understand the meaning of going slow is the quickest path to success. People just want instant gratification. It's the world we're living in right now. And that's why people continue to focus strictly on cannabis and want a taste of that run that happened five, six years ago. And as you said earlier in this podcast, that if you stuck in cannabis, there were so many opportunities that you missed out on over the last 12 months. Listen, I'd love to chat and continue chatting for the next hour or so. This has been incredible. I appreciate you checking in. Ben, as always, great insight as well, both of you this week. Um, but glad that we uh, kind of got our points across and uh, cleared the air a little bit at what happened on Twitter this week, but most importantly how um, there's a lot of respect, obviously, of all the people that are involved. And I think, obviously, communication and conversations uh, is the key, obviously, to uh, you know keep people well-informed when it comes to this industry. So I think next time we should uh, maybe have you and Todd on, and that'll be a good conversation to have at the same time. I'll have to reach out to him. But anyways, appreciate you checking in this yeah, week. It's been great. Yeah. And, and again, look, I, right. you know, I'll leave, I'll leave with <clears> this, <throat> right? I want to leave on a positive note. I think that the re-rating in cannabis is going to be wildly profitable. And it's, it's going to blow people's minds when it happens, you know? So don't be afraid that you're going to miss out. You know, like if you have to pay an extra 10%, for something that'll probably yeah. go a thousand percent, who cares? You got to look at it like that, right? You know? Exactly. Like, so keep your, yeah. you know, like keep your chin up. Um, just uh, you know, don't be in such a rush right now, right? Well said. Yeah. Ben. Yeah, it's great to be on the show. You, great to see Jason. All right, cheers, guys. All right, guys, let's keep in touch. Hey, everyone, thanks for watching. And if you like this video, wait until you see what we have next. Some of the best thought leaders in the verticals that we cover, from cannabis and psychedelics to cryptos and NFTs and sports wagering. So if you want to learn more, make sure to click on that bell for all notifications. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.